I hate to break the fishing news up here, Chuck, but I'd like to speak about the ice hockey. Congratulations. You're one of the 13 listeners of the Real Life Podcast. We just traded a migraine in for, like, an orgasm. Might want to mark that down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All of my projects are on schedule until they're not. A member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. About as funny as we're going to get uh. today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Episode 189 of the Real Life Podcast. I'm Tyler Remchuk, Chalmers, Wanye, Jay, Bagged Milk. Everyone's here. First podcast. I, I want to say it's been three or four podcasts since everyone's been here. So uh, this is an exciting time. Does someone have their radio on in the background? No, nope. uh, I, I guess it's the one driving the truck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably. Chalmers, I, you want to do us the honor of going on mute? What the fuck? Well, no, it's the yeah. I can go on mute. No, no, or speak your mind by all means. <laughs> I don't have my radio on because the Bluetooth plays through the radio. So, yeah. no, I don't have any music on. Well, I appreciate that. There was some sort of noise going on, but it's gone now, so we're all good. Um, I I usually go around to ask everyone how's their how their week is going and all that, but uh, bag milk, I'll just I'll just throw to you first. Um, <laughs> there was free hashtag the good life free glass shards or something. You know what? So my stupid bit that I've been doing for years now, where I find shit on the side of the road, post it on Instagram, and tag it with the real uh, with the good life as a hashtag, backfired on me in a hilarious way yesterday. I was taking my man Franco for a little walk, did a little uh, drive past, walk past my vehicle, which is parked on the road while my uh, while the building maintenance continues, and there I saw a smashed out window. So I post that on Instagram because I was annoyed, and then a bunch of people started chiming in with the good life and free glass <laughs> shards and it was it was great i honestly it made me laugh this is my own doing and i was happy to see people getting back at me for it <laughs> yeah i mean i just i just I don't uh, think that has anything to do with that that's not bad karma making fun of things that you find on the ground there is no reason that people should be making making you feel like shit because all of a sudden you got your back window smashed i wish i could find the person smash your back fucking window smash their back windows in and their face because I hate public vandalism. Well, it's super Chalmers, are, you, are you having a day? Are you okay, buddy? Yeah, I am. Not well, good. I, appreciate, I appreciate you, Chalmers. Like, but like I was saying before we started, there's, I don't know if somebody smashed my window intentionally because nothing got stolen. Everything was where I left it, albeit covered in glass. Um, or if there was just something like they, the grounds crew was cutting the grass and fired a rock through the window. I have no idea. So did you CIS it or CSI it, I mean? Like, did you figure, did you look for where the penetration point was? Jesus, I was crazy Mike in the void? Uh, yeah. Penetration point? What kind of fucking podcast is this? That should be your album name, John. Everything that gets broken point. has a penetration point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's I've... also uh, featured heavily on my OnlyFans account. Um <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I looked inside. I couldn't see there was no rock or anything. I took a look on the ground. There was nothing obvious. So I have no idea. Was anything taken? No, nope, it was all, all there, just covered in glass. In the, yeah. in the name, in the name of, of, of crime and vandalism, I think a story needs to be brought up about one of our, 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 our co-hosts of real life. I think the listeners need to know about how Chalmers took justice into his own hands and had his truck stolen from oh, the Home Depot shit. parking lot. And he tracked down the oh. guy and found it and found the guy, got the guy arrested and got his truck back. This is oh, one of the oh, greatest yeah. stories in, in the, the West afternoon. End of the last 20 years. So, so if Chalmers says he wants to find that guy, that he'll probably find that guy. Because Chalmers what Chalmers does. Chalmers, you're like I, the street. Can I have some you're like Liam on Neeson. This? Yeah, you're well, like yeah. Liam Neeson and Taken. It's Chalmers' so, story to tell. So yeah, basically, I I like to I hate people that do like steal vehicles, public vandalism. So I um I get vigilante the minute I hear about or see something happening. Anyways, when I I used to have a work truck, and what happened with the work truck is back in the is this a red days, truck, Chalmers? This is my little bat Mazda B four thousand. Yeah, I remember oh, that yeah. truck. Yeah, and so. I would. I went to the Home Depot. It was early, 7 a.m. in the morning, and it was freezing cold outside. So I left the truck running in the contractor entrance because I just needed two cans of spray foam, and I had to get back to the job. I locked both the doors like you do, like I thought. Um, and as I'm standing in the lineup of the Home Depot and get buying my purchase of two cans of spray foam, 
I hear an already started truck trying to turn over. And I'm like, that sounds like my truck trying to turn over because if you've ever done it. So I run outside and I see this dude's head in my in my driver's seat, bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving. And I'm like, holy shit. So I run up to the car with a Kansas spray foam in my arm and I'm trying to open the door, but it's locked and I can't get in. So I hit the window once, doesn't break. I hit the window again, doesn't break. And now he gets into gear and he takes off. And so I run after him for about 30 yards and throw the spray cans at him. <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm like, well, fuck, he's gone. So I get back to the Home Depot and all I have is my cell phone. So I call my mom and I said, I called the police. I told them it was stolen. But I called my mom and I said, you have to come back. You have to come to the Home Depot and pick me up and take me back home. And back home, what I have there was a brand new Honda Civic SIR ready for ready for a hunt. And so I say to myself, <laughs> so the, the, the only part about this is that you got to be kind of like, you got to have a criminal mind to, to figure out how <laughs> criminals act, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking we're at the West End Home Depot. And to get to my house, we have to drive past the mall. It's 7 a.m. I go, perfect place for cover. Because what you want to do when you steal a car is you want to get all the stuff into a bag that you can sell or at a pawn shop and ditch the car. You do not want to have the car. So you need to do this quick. Okay. That's a bigger charge. If you're found with the truck, if you just have stolen property, you can get out of it a lot easier now. So I know this because I've been, I've been on the street a few times, but I've never, I've never stolen a car and I've never publicly vandalized anything. And I've never stolen. I've never broken into a car. I just know because I, I open my ears and I open my eyes and I'm not an idiot. So, I say to my mom, as we're driving home, can we pull into the West Edmonton Mall parking lot and just have a quick look? Just drive around. It's going to be empty. We'll just do one quick circle, and then we'll go back home. She says yes, because she's a, she's a gamer, too. She wants to find this asshole. And so <laughs> that takes about, you know, five to ten minutes. All of this kind of timing, it, 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 it comes to a head in the end, and that's why you kind of got to know the timing of it all. So it's been about 30 minutes now since my truck has been driven away from me in the Home Depot parking lot. I get to my house. I throw on my track pants, my fastest Nikes, just in case there's going to be a foot race. And I get into my Honda Civic and I think to myself, now, I'm in the West End. Where's the next place if it's not a covered parking lot that you would take it? Well, you take it to a neighborhood where construction is going on, basically out into a field, into the middle of nowhere. Where is that happening right now? Well, on Collingwood Road, you hadn't been able to get to the Henday yet, and they were just building Donsdale. This is where my dad's company was building all of its houses. So I knew this. I knew the area. So I get in my truck or my car, and I drive down the street towards the Collingwood Fire Hall. I'm in my car for about one minute. I'm sitting there, and I'm finally just decompressing like, man, if I find this guy, like, what am I really going to do? And as I say do in my head, my truck drives past me right in front of me. So I'm now sitting at a red light with a left-hand signal lane on. It's busy traffic, and my truck is just driven past me. So what do I do? What any good crime fighter would do? I go into oncoming traffic <laughs> at a red light and turn, with, and I hit I hit the VTEC about three times to get into the third so I can catch up to him. And uh, dangerously, I catch up to him. And so now I get on my cell phone, and I'm calling the police. And I, I, I get somebody quickly. I say, listen. I am following a truck that has just been stolen from me about 35 minutes ago. This is where I am. I'm going to stay on the phone. Please send somebody. They're like, we got somebody on the way. I said, okay, sounds good. She said, do not confront him. Do not get out. Uh, and so we're driving around. Now, we do about three U-turns before I can tell that this guy has figured out that I am following him now. And he starts to step on it in my truck. And I'm starting to say to the police, you guys got to hurry up. This guy's going to start to make things real dangerous all of a sudden. So we, we start going towards the Henday, and he realizes he can't go anywhere. It's a dead end. So he does a U-turn, and he's staring at me. And now I can tell that he knows I'm the guy. It was at the window. So he takes off, and he's coming over the hill at the Donsdale uh, uh, Tim Hortons, and all of a sudden a cop car with the cherries pulls right in front of him and pulls him over and I pull up right behind, and I get out, and just like any good crime fighter do, I start pointing at him, and I start jumping around going, I got 
you motherfucker! And, I'm dead. <laughs> and the cop comes out with guns drawn, and they take this dude down. So oh. he says to me, he goes, "Go back, get back in your car." And I said, "Absolutely, sir. Let me know when I can come. Let me know how I can help." So I go back to my car. I sit in my car. I wait for them to empty the pocket. You know, cuff this dude as you would, and put him in the back of the car. And then they bring me to the pile of stuff that he has in his pocket, and they ask me if any of it is mine. What he had in his pocket was about a 10-inch knife, a thing of lube, and sex of tokens course. for a sex bar. So, naturally, I took the tokens uh, and said the <laughs> lube was not mine and the knife was not mine. Um, so I was pretty happy I didn't uh, confront this guy, but it was a matter of about 42 minutes from the time my truck was stolen to the time that I was dancing in front of this guy and had caught my truck. Wow. That's yeah. absolutely that was unreal. a journey, man. Man, the it's adrenaline you must have been though. feeling that whole time? Like, holy shit. So it was. It was crazy. So now I had gotten my truck back, and, like, my adrenaline had been, like, at high levels for about an hour now, right? Like, you know, there, there's there's a bit more to the story where, like, I had to go drive my car <laughs> home, and then it came back to the truck, like, looking through my stuff and being like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And it, I don't know. It was weird. But finally, I get my, myself home, and it's like, around 10 30 now and it's kind of not the greatest day out and so i know that my friends that work outside are probably preparing for a rain day and what they used to do at around 21 years old was we would go to a establishment and have some some pints during the day and so i had to celebrate so <laughs> i just went and got went and got day drunk for the rest of the day with my buddies hell but yeah, yeah the, the adrenaline was it was unbelievable i never felt anything like it and just to get it back and just to like it was right around the time of the Olympics, and I remember just, like, we watched Olympic hockey the rest of that day, and, yeah, so, that's how, that, that's the story of my truck getting stolen and me getting it back in 42 minutes. That's incredible. Have you now, great story. Have you now been spending your life trying to get that same level of adrenaline in different ways? Well, yeah, like, I would have, like, begged Milk to have called me and said, hey, my back window got smashed out, could you come over here, look for clues, to find this motherfucker, and I would have been on it. <sighs> The minute, incredible. Incredible. the minute you get to cross over into, like, uh, self-authorized militia slash police slash firefighter slash ambulance, it's crazy. I remember one time driving home from the bar, and uh, the guy I was with, he's driving, he's sober, and I'm drunk, and I'm not. And we witnessed a giant fucking accident and, like, had to get out of our car and treat the people on scene and call 911. Like... The lady had a bone sticking out of her arm and shit, and like I had to wrap it in my jacket because it was bleeding, and put her in my in this guy's truck where I'm sitting, and there's like blood everywhere and shit. It was like minus eight million degrees out, so we couldn't not put them in the car. So in that minute, in that minute, did you react the way that you when you look back on it? Are you proud of the way? Like, cause that sounds amazing. Like you wrapped some some wounds and stuff. Like yeah. I would never want to be in a situation like that where I look back on it. And I'm, like, not proud of myself for how I did. You know what I mean? So you must yeah, be proud yeah. of yourself. No, no, I got involved. Like, generally speaking, if I see some horrific shit, I'll run towards it. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that was good. as fuck. But then the, the fire department came, and they, like, roared up on scene. They're like, good job. We'll take it from here. And I'm like, my God, my dick just grew four inches. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn right, you'll take it from here, fellow <laughs> law enforcement hero. Where's my badge? Yeah. The closest thing I ever had to that, like when I worked at the mall, um, you know, they have you trained on like what to do if you think someone's stealing and all that stuff. And, you know, like never leave the store to chase after someone who's stolen stuff. And I followed that. I had no interest in like running after someone. But I remember one day I was like, you know, eight o'clock at night. We're an hour away from closing. The person I was with went on their last break. So I'm in the Jersey shop by myself and uh, someone comes in with like four or five kids. And these kids are scattering all over the store. They're bringing stuff to the tail, being like, how much is this? Is this on sale? And it's kind of just like, oh, yeah, sure, kid. Like, whatever, you're answering their questions. And then I kind of just like... Classic diversion. Yeah, I <laughs> kind of like look up, and like all of a sudden, like everyone was kind of gone. And I didn't really think much of it at the time. It's, you know, 8 o'clock on like a fucking Wednesday, so I didn't care. Um, and then the person I was working with came back, and I was like, did you sell all those McDavid jerseys? And I was like, hold up, what? I do not know. I didn't make a single sale while you were gone. And this lady who had come in, swiped them all, stuffed them in a stroller and dipped. And I, like, I was so distracted with all the kids running around and all that. 
it was a what so i like called mall security and like as soon as i started describing it they were like we know exactly who that is when was it and i was like i don't know like five ten minutes ago I, and uh they're like oh we can still get her and apparently she was like going through the mall like for a long time and that was her scheme and she would always hit up the sports stores and the levian rose and like kids would run around she'd throw stuff in the stroller and dip and uh, they got What's her that night. it was wild it was wild yeah it's like a women's like underwear lingerie store people are buying stolen underwear uh yeah i think <laughs> and i, I use like, tag still stuff. on yeah hey yeah. dollars you got you got an important holiday coming up. You want half price laundry? <laughs> I'm always trying to kajiji underwear. Come on. <laughs> um, but that's like the only time I've ever come face to face with crime like that. And uh, even that, like I never even left from behind the counter. And that I had some adrenaline going for that. My vigilante story goes back to I was bartending, and uh, like the, there's a bunch of people sitting at the wood. So as a bartender, you have conversations. And, uh, dope striking up a call, uh, a call, a chat. And then all of a sudden, uh, this other guy standing at the other side of the bar is like, uh, is that guy, was that guy over there? Like, you just walked out allowed to be behind the bar. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, he just came back here to this like area. And this area that he was pointing to is where the till is for all the VLT money. So for the payout. So I'm like, uh, okay. So I call him and just kind of go to walk out the door. And this guy bolts. And I'm like, fuck. Because this guy's probably got like two or three grand in cash. And I'm like, holy shit, I got to get this back. This is on my watch. Fuck this. And just, I ran after this guy. This guy was on like a crazy adrenaline high. I had to chase this guy down for, fuck. It was like, it was like, a, it felt like 40 kilometers, but it was probably like 800 meters. Oh, hey, buddy. And, uh, and, um, uh, Sorry, I'm walking down a nice nature path, and a dog just came up to want to get a pet. Um, and so, I but I I was gassed like 200 meters into this run because I was in horrific shape, and I was like, oh, I gotta keep up with this guy. I've got to keep up with him. And then I got there and I cornered him uh, between a car and like this like garage door and fence, and I had him cornered. So thankfully, the other staff members from the bar were behind me because I don't know what this guy has. I'm just trying to like contain him because I want, I just want him to fuck off and I want this bag and the money back. And uh, thankfully like the, the other two guys come now, there's three of us, the guy shits his pants, drops everything and runs. So he left his bag and then we open up the bag. Sure as shit, there's the money, a bunch of pornographic magazines oh. and, and like this, like I, I was going to say it's, it, it was, it was police paperwork. Like he. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if it's, a, it's it can't be a warrant for his arrest because the police have that, but it's like his like probation paperwork or something, and uh, that's why you want to fuck off. So yeah, I, and, and then I had I went back to the bar because I, I I overexerted myself. It took me like two hours to get my breath back. So I was just running on this like crazy adrenaline high, and I was in no shape to do this, and I had to keep up with this motherfucker who was who had hit the turbos because he's trying to not go to jail, and. Uh, I was able to pin him down, and we were able to cuff him, Dano. Remember how he threw all Fuck the cash down. under the car, Jake? Yeah, you threw the cash. That's right. You threw the cash under yeah. the car. Because he's like, yeah. I don't have any cash. I was part of the group of people who were running much slower than Jake. So we wheeled up. He's like, search me, search me. I have no cash. And we, like, checked him. We're like, right, he has no cash. Yeah. And Jay looked <laughs> under the car, and he's like, he threw the cash under the car. We're like, he threw the cash under the car. And then he ran. Yeah, that's right. He threw it under the thing. He's like, I don't have anything. I'm like, yeah, you do. I saw you throw it under the car. And everybody came. That's right. Everything was thrown under the car. Cash and pornography bag. Damn. It wasn't bad porn when we looked at it later. Well, I still have it. Um, Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to steal like, porn, He though. had, like, paperwork from court. It was, like, aggravated assault, robbery, battery. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. So the guy was on the lam and <laughs> uh, tried to... Uh, steal some money from the bar but we got it back but yeah i remember two hours i was just sitting in a chair and everyone's like jay get back to work i'm like i can't breathe <laughs> that everyone your m check is me in that story <laughs> like we got robbed three hours ago you get back to it oh yeah there's uh, two people waiting for a fake chicken finger <laughs> bagged milk do you have a vigilante story the only thing i got uh, nothing nearly as impressive as the rest of you, to be honest. The only thing I got is I used to work at my sister's radio shack when I was a younger, a younger gentleman. 
And one time I was near the back of the store just stocking shelves, as I did, and I saw a guy stealing a DVD player walking out the front door. So I ran out after him. And of course, this Radio Shack was in a little strip mall. And outside of the strip mall, there was like rock beds kind of there. He got into a waiting car and started driving away. I ran outside after the door after him, grabbed one of the rocks, threw a cutter right down Broadway, broke the back window in his car. Oh, shit. Called the cops. And they found him as a result of the back window being broken on Whoa. said car. So did, That's you, all I got. did you end up getting in shit for breaking the window? No, I did not. Nice. nice. I did. I, you know what? In hindsight, I probably could have gotten shit, especially if I would have hit somebody with a rock. But my first thought was I ran out the door, grabbed a rock and whipped it at the car and smashed the window. That's all I got. Oh. Not nearly as impressive, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I've got, I've got a few more from the bar days. Me too. I was, I was going to say, Jay, we should sit down in advance of the podcast, declare <laughs> what topics are off limit, and we should tell war stories of the bar days. <laughs> oh, God. Stories, I, th- I think that could be a fun segment. Oh, like, like when the when Hell's Angels walk into your bar yeah. and everyone's like scared shitless and you have to go up to them and ask them to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse That's me, fun. sir. <laughs> I remember one time don't a miss brawl that. breaking out I bought a brawl breaking out at like 3 in the afternoon on a Saturday and a guy picking up like a full on like sandwich board sign for beer and going to hit a guy with it and instead hitting like an old man sitting there having lunch with his wife what and this fuck? poor old dude who was like a tough guy back in the day probably but now was just like, a, like in his 50s or some shit and he got clobbered by this beer sign. And so, like, oh. the fight breaks out. It's like, middle of the day. What the fuck? There's no bounces or anything. So you shoo everybody out. And then you go back. And this poor guy was like, I just wanted to come and get some pizza. And I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> killing all uh, people. This reminds me. Definitely, we, Chalmers, we got to tell the, hus- the, the Husky shit story at some point this summer. Oh, God. But uh, should we tell it for him? No, he's got to tell his own story. No, he he would he'll never do it. He'll never get hold of it. He'll, no, he'll never do it. He'll I've told yeah, I've told him like fifty story times. Of all time. Well, maybe he could maybe maybe on Friday when we go golfing he could tell it, uh, and on on like a record like we could record him telling it and then that's just play it. it. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. We'll try. Do that. Just record a voice note. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This husky yeah. story has been like two years in the making. I know. I know. Chalmers, tell him not to say his name. Yeah. And just record it as an audio note. Well, we would, yeah, we could. We'd have to do it after. And like, when we're sitting around a table, it's just, I think he'd do it at. To be honest. We'll, never we'll, we'll, try. we'll never say his name and he doesn't have to incriminate himself. We could well, even he, get Tyler to adjust the pitch and bring it he, down like he's he a already, He already knows that we're going to tell it at some point. So at least there's that level of comfort. There's a ton of noise going on right now. He has to tell it. He has to tell it because it's so fucking funny. Chalmers is turning left. Can't you tell? Yeah. Chalmers, eight people are listening to this podcast. If you could not leave your blinker on for 45 (laughs) seconds, that'd be amazing. While Chalmers does that, I'm going to remind everyone. I'm actually going to mute the guys on the call so I can get a good solid ad read off and remind everyone listening that Jappa's fleet is ready for rental season. If you're looking for daily, weekly, monthly, earth-moving equipment rentals, Jappa has you covered. Their fleet includes excavators, wheel loaders, compaction, and asphalt equipment. All machines are newer, cleaned, maintained, and supported by Jappa's top-notch service. Check them out, jappamachinery.com. And that's a good solid ad. You guys are off mute, by the way, so you can uh, you can start talking again. But Robert, you can I'll, turn I'll, your blinker on again, you fuck. Uh, allow me to quote Tyler Yemchuk in that uh, ad read. Compaction. Compaction. Nice <laughs> Nice inflection there. Once in a while, hey, I like listen. just messing with how a word is said. Like uh, the other day, I don't remember if it was on here on Oilers Nation Radio. It was on Oilers Nation Radio. I know Radio. what it was. You said you said almonds, and it was ridiculous. I said I said like almond or something like that. Yeah. I don't know, just to kind of throw a curveball in there when you're talking, keep people on their toes, right? When someone's listening and they hear a word said differently, it, they, they perk up a bit. You kind of go like, what the fuck did he just say? You know, get the ears back and engaged. One of the things think- that I do that drives my sister insane we were little kids is I mispronounce words because my brain's like either trying to change words mid word or I'm not even listening to myself talk. So I'll just say a word all weird and it drives my sister nuts. She's like, stop fucking saying words weird. Just listen to yourself talk, you idiot. So there you are, you're in. 
Almond. 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 Do you say do you say pajamas or pajamas? Pajama. 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 Once in a while, I like to I like to speak the Queens with some words, and I'll say the British pronunciation. Good on you. Yes. Just to pay respect. Thank you. My two my two biggest ones that I can't stand are when people say palo. Actually, people will call a pillow a palo. No. Or, yeah, I've, I've heard never it. heard that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I listen I, to people I'll say, hey, that. hey, can you pass me a pillow? And you're like, a what? Or else when they say milk with an yep. A uh, that's, instead of milk. Yeah, that's stupid. Uh, God, that's milk. annoying. I'm kind of a milk guy. I'm like, on a, uh, uh, like I say milk, milk. Don't say milk. Milk, uh, whatever. Milk, milk. <laughs> it, it's milk. Um, okay, there was a story, unless someone has... There's yeah, someone's got to stop with this noise going on in the background because I'm gonna lose it. What is it? Is it me? It's like a Not screeching. Him. It's like a screeching. Does it go away when I push? Uh, yeah, it's gone now. I think <laughs> it's either. Oh, and there you go. Chalmers, uh, Chalmers is gone. Chalmers has dropped out entirely. So there's a story up on OilersNation.com. You can go ahead and read it uh, about the Connor McDavid card that is going for just an absurd amount of money right now uh it's up at an auction when bag milk wrote the article a day ago it was seventy thousand dollars when i checked earlier this morning the card and right now actually there's a day left on it uh ninety three thousand dollars for this Connor mcdavid hockey card and uh u.s by the way u.s, US. um for why? those of you here's so i'll explain to you why this card is worth so much here um so you're, i'll give you another look at it there as you can see there's a nice piece of his jersey there's an autograph as well, and it's also graded to a 9 out of 10 up at the top there. So this card is a rookie patch autograph, Connor McDavid, from a series called The Cup. And that is like the highest of high. That It's the pinnacle of sport or of hockey cards. One pack of them. They come in. Allow me to flex a little here to the guys on the cam. They come in a tin that looks like this, and it goes for $700 for this tin, and you get seven cards in it. So you're paying roughly 100 bucks a card. You don't know what's in there. You paid $700 for that tin? I won it in a raffle, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> Sorry, Chalmers. No investigation here. The podcasting industry isn't that ludicrous yet, uh, Chalmers. But so that's where this McDavid card came from. It's serial number. Did you mean it, Mo, Did you mean to say lucrative or ludicrous? Did I say ludicrous? You Luda. said ludicrous. Luda. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Keeping you guys on your toes. At least someone's paying attention. Oh, yeah. Um, so this card, it's uh numbered out of ninety nine. There's only ninety nine of them, and this one that's going for ninety thousand dollars is number ninety seven. So it's got like a little bit of added value on it there as well. But uh, going for ninety three k. So the question I wanted to ask you guys, I don't think anyone here has a piece of Oilers memorabilia worth ninety thousand dollars. But is there something you have now or something you got as a kid, a piece of Oilers memorabilia that like was your that you kept it on your mantle as a kid or something like that, or maybe you have it hanging on the wall now, something like that. Is there one piece of Oilers memorabilia that tops it all for you? In terms of weirdness or value? Go wherever you want with it. I mean, you, you really can do whatever you want. Uh, I've got a signed Nuge photo frame. That I what? wouldn't sell for $93,000? Yeah, right. I know. I have yeah, two I'm looking things at... that I have. <laughs> One, I have a picture, a poster that I used to have on my wall. And every bedroom I ever lived in, I put this picture on the wall. And it's a picture. It's a 7-Up ad. And it's a picture of Wayne Gretzky. And he's in his Oilers uniform. And it's probably like 1984. And he's doing the old stopping pose. A bunch of snow coming up. His hair is long and flowing, and it's a uh, 7-Up ad, and I've had that poster, and I'm not going to lie to you. I went to my parents' house the other day, and uh, I was, excuse me, I was grabbing something from underneath the stairs, and I found the poster protector that I had put it in, and I thought it was gone, I, and it was in there. And so I showed my boys it literally last night. Oh, so cool. I still have the poster. Are you going to put that um, back up? Do you have an office somewhere to I'm hang gonna that? I'm going to frame it. Oh, yeah. I'm going to frame it and I'm going to get like, I'm going to put it in a nice protective, not just like with another bunch of tack marks through it. Um, the second thing is I bought a signed Mark Messier picture from an <laughs> Oilers game that was, um, 
the one of him when he gets the cup and he's staring at Gretzky and they're both like shaking it. Yeah. And, yeah. And so that's my, that's my pride and joy. That thing's my favorite. You should get that, that Gretzky poster signed. It'd be like fucking priceless. Yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> well, I already got it. I already got a Gretzky jersey signed, and so it says your friend Wayne Gretzky. So I mean, we're Ooh. buddies. That's all. Uh, maybe I can make it happen. Call him up. There you go. Call him up. Bag milk. You got anything? I'm not really a big memorabilia guy, to be honest. Yeah, you're not even like uh, really a big Oilers jersey guy either, right? I have one jersey. It's a Nuge jersey, and I made the commitment that when he signs an extension, I will buy all three flavors. Of Nuge jerseys. Oh, good on you. But my most valuable memorabilia, I guess, is, and I've told this actually on the podcast not that long ago, is when I went down into the bowels of Rexall yeah. place when you used to be able to stand outside the, the dressing room door and Bill Ranford signed the program for me. So that was pretty cool. One thing that now that I'm thinking about it, I wish I brought up when we had him on the podcast is my brother in law bought Sam Gagne's gloves from the eight point night. Really? What? Wow. You forgot yeah, to mention that? I completely huh. forgot until just now. <laughs> and he has them in like one of those little glass cases or whatever. And he will never tell me how much he paid for them. All he said was five figures. So 10 grand yeah. or more. Oh, wow. I'm we surprised. Those I'm back surprised. To Sam. Yeah, I'm surprised those didn't uh, end up in the Hall of Fame. I'm, sure I'm there's, surprised too, I'm sure actually. Like the stick or something was, right? Yeah, he, so he's got those. He bought it at like one of those Oilers season end auctions from that year. Yeah. If wow, I was Sam Gagne, I wouldn't want him in the Hall of Fame because if you remember from my segment called Overrated Places in the World after I got back from Toronto, the <laughs> Hall of Fame was right up there. It was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me in the memorabilia, I got it. I actually have it sitting right next to me here. Down, down in there, there's a program from the Oilers' first game back in the playoffs after the Decade of Darkness, and uh, I got that signed by Zach Cassian. As well, so that's one that I mean, it's probably worth jack shit. But for me, like you got through the decade of darkness, you got to game one, round one of the playoffs. I went to the game with my dad, so I got that one. I also have a good memorabilia story about my dad because he's really into this stuff. Um, it was the second last season at Rexall, first game of the year. You know how they have those auction tables set up everywhere, right? They had a signed Connor McDavid, Erie Otters jersey. This was heading into his draft year, right? So the Oilers, this is the year they would have came. Third, last, won the lottery, blah, blah, blah. So this jersey's at the auction table. My dad's kind of eyeing it up. He ends up getting it for like dirt cheap for like relatively to what it should sell for. He got it for like $550. And we're leaving and he goes, picks it up. And I was like, why would you get that? Like, you really think the Oilers are going to be that bad again this year? My dad was like, yep, 100% he's coming here. Not a doubt in my mind. He put his money where his mouth is. Bought that jersey, brought it home, kept it in the box. Oilers win the lottery. He pulls it out, buys a frame, puts it on the wall. That's where it's been ever since. But he straight up like wow. called, he called the shot. Wow. Like, beginning of the year is crazy. So now we have, he also went out and bought uh, a white McDavid jersey from the when he was drafted that McDavid signed and then wrote 2015 first overall pick on it. So he has those two like framed next to each other. But. When it comes to my dad, that's like that's a pretty baller move. Just being like, that's trust me. Dope. Trust my favorite me. McDavid thing is actually Wanye did it. Was we had the McDavid draft party at the Pint downtown, and as soon as they called his name first overall, Wanye slips on a fresh McDavid jersey with the Captain C already on the front of it. So I have a good story about that. So uh, I was, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, when McDavid was drafted, I was working at uh, Jersey City. And we had like the second, the day they won the lottery from that point forward, every, every shift I worked four or five people, can I get a McDavid Jersey? And it's like, no, you're, we aren't allowed to sell them because he hasn't played a game. You can only sell stuff once a player has played a game. And yet, and yet your M check, I showed up with the draft lottery yeah. in a C Jersey. How does that work? So we also had like our, uh, our heat press machine, right? Where you could just put a custom name or number. So people would always be like, why can't I put McDavid on the back? I'm, I'm not doing it because of Connor. I just want those letters on it. And it's always like, no, we're not allowed to do that because the NHL is like watching or the NHL PA and all that is watching us. And we could get in trouble with like our vendors if we get caught doing that. The sport check in the mall, I believe it was, did get caught doing that. And they got like their warning. And if they would have done it again, it would have been something like a massive fine. And they would have had some shit to deal with legally and all that. Um, but we had so many people. 
coming in. Print us one, print us one. So I'm, I'm surprised. Are you going to, how'd you get it? Well, I'm on you, your M check. The guy was like, I can't do that. I'm like, you're going to do it. And you're going to put a captain C on there. He's like, I can't do that for real. Like, you fucking do it right now. You beat this yet. It's the first McDavid jersey with a C of an oiler with a C on it. Um, but I remember the night he was drafted, I had to work. And we had, a, like, a couple days before, all these boxes showed up in the back from our uh, from our stock. And I was like, what are those? And my manager's like, you are not allowed back there for the next two days. You are not allowed to open those because I know you. And I know you're going to take a photo. And you know you're going to try tweet it and all that. And uh, the second McDavid was drafted, we got, like, the vendors got special permission. Because if you notice, in his draft photo, he's wearing a jersey with 97 on it already, right? And yeah. every mm-hmm. other player just wears the year. So he, like, Eichel had a 15 on or whatever. Um, but we had boxes and boxes and boxes of orange McDavid stuff with 97 on the back. So, like, the second he was drafted, we put it out. We were expecting, like, a huge rush. I think we sold, like, one that night. Like, we, we weren't allowed to promote it or anything. But that's uh, that's another McDavid memorabilia story I have was uh, open up those boxes and be like, oh, my God, they're going to orange next year. It's crazy. I'm going to wear that McDavid jersey his entire career, wear it to his final game in the NHL, no matter where it is, and then I'll frame it and retire it. It's going to be a long time. I know. Hopefully he's an oiler for his entire career. So is a signed Moose Jaw Warrior Noah Gregor jersey any good? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's that you priceless. won in a fucking absolute 11th hour chuck-a-puck riggery? Yeah. Is the second place guy in the chuck-a-puck? It is a very valuable jersey. Yeah, it's very sentimental. We're playing chuck a puck Chalmers and Moose Jaw for a Noah Gregor jersey, which obviously we both want, right? And chuck a puck at Moose Jaw isn't exactly fucking the Olympics of skill, but I'm very close to center ice with my puck. And then Jay has some mystery 11th hour puck in his pocket. He probably fucking brought from home. You know when he blocks a shot into the forest and miraculously finds it, but isn't shooting? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, same move with Chuck a puck and basically hits it right in the bullseye with the last puck with everyone watching and then goes and gets his jersey, which he proceeds to wear out to the bar despite it being game worn. <laughs> yeah, I reeked. I wore it all night. New Year's Eve. The New amount Year's. of luck, like that. That's, that's got to be a first for two people sitting right next to each other to come first and second and chuck a buck. Maybe I was 11th. I don't care. I definitely wasn't going to be fucking. Anyway. Oh. Yeah. But, Jay, uh, didn't you also win the auction on the Smitty jersey from Moose Jaw as well when we went down there? Isn't that how yeah. that ended up in your office? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was. Uh, I had strict. I was given strict direction by Wanya to come home with that at all costs. <laughs> that's and amazing. That honestly is one of my favorite pieces. Of I was going to say, yeah. I was waiting for one of you guys to say that because that does that not combine your guys' two favorite things or three yeah. hockey, Ryan yeah. Smith, and Moose Jaw? So, oh, our, office, super our office at Little Brick, we have a Ryan Smith Moose Jaw Warrior jersey that was signed. signed that was on his retirement night from the Warriors. And then we have a Ryan Smith jersey. Framed. And it was at the Oilers jersey they wore in warm-up game? Yeah, all the players wore well, Smitty yeah. Oilers jersey, so we won uh, one of the auctions for one of them. And then in the middle, we have the photo of Smitty as the captain in his final game raising his stick. And on the back of that photo, it says, like, to Oilers Nation, I love you, Chalmers, cheated the fishing. <laughs> and it's a, that, that, that shit, that trio of uh, Smitty things for me is, is, is awesome. Yeah. It's old memorabilia. So I was, I was coming home from Moose Jaw the, the day after because uh, they had this, like, they call it a sportsman dinner. So they always bring in, like, um, like athletes and stuff to come, and they host the night, and they kind of do a hot stove with them, and it's a fundraiser there. So it's always a big to-do. So Smithy was the, the feature guy, and a few, like, Gila Fleur was there, and some some other guys were there, and uh, it was... It was Good night, and I, 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 I've never. Mary really Levine is there. I don't remember. Nah, just, just, yeah, just uh, yeah. I, I was gonna say, I don't think if it's Ryan Smith and Guy Lafleur, I mean Smitty might not be the headliner there. Well, uh, it was Smitty's Son weekend. His jersey's being retired uh, okay, okay. in Moose Jaw. Uh, no, Smitty's royalty. He, that makes he, more sense. He supplants Lafleur. Uh, so whatever, great night. And I have the orders. I have to. I have to win this photo now. <laughs> I wish I took a different tactic. I started. I started bidding on it early i should have waited because i was i was me and this one person going back and forth and i never saw who the first was we were both hiding from each other it wow. was very well it was very stealthy but <laughs> sure as shit every time you go check 
the next person would strike. And uh, I, sh- I should have just stayed quiet and then came in heavy at the 11th hour. But whatever, we got it. And so the next day I'm coming home to Edmonton and I'm in Regina and I hop on the plane. And I'm carrying the photo with me because I'm not checking it. That thing is, you know, I bought a seat for it uh, to come home and strapped it in. And uh, sure as shit, I walk on the plane. I'm carrying this big thing. And, 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 and like, like Ryan Smith and I have kind of interacted loosely in passing. And we, we talked a little bit in Moose Jaw because Gregor was there covering it. And so Gregor let me kind of uh, sit in a little bit when he was interviewing Smitty. So Smitty, at least kind of my face was still kind of fresh in his mind. So I walk on the plane and he's like, hey, hey. And it's him and his wife and his family. <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, what do you got there? What did you get? I'm like, well, I turn around. I'm like, I got you. <laughs> and his wife's like, oh, my God. And, and Ryan's like, well, uh, uh, <laughs> do, you, do you want me to sign it? Like, can, can, I, can I sign that for you? And I was like, uh, yeah, Ryan Smith, you can sign this. And uh, whatever, I just went back to my seat. I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to fuck this up. Like, this is going great. I just left. Uh, and then, you know, I left the plane. I didn't want to bother him. I'm walking away. And then he just, like, yells, like, hey, hey, do you still want me to sign this? So they, like, tracked me down. And then he wrote on the back, like, Toilet Nation, like, thank you. And, like, signed it. It was fucking wicked. Actually, before we move on, that night also, one of my favorite pieces of memorabilia, I didn't even think about it because it's kind of, it's put away, it's in plastic right now. I have an OG Nation hoodie, one of the big logo zip-ups, the very first ones. And that night we went to Ryan Smith's retirement. He signed it for me in the box we were in. So I've got an Oilers Nation hoodie with a big Ryan. It just says... Uh, thank you to Oilers Nation and the signature underneath it, and I love it. So I've got it in plastic in my in my closet. Oh, that's, that's pretty dope. Uh, as we move on, one more uh, quickly. Nation beer, Canada Day cans are officially la- are announced. When are when can we see them in liquor stores? They are uh, liquor stores already submitted their orders earlier this week, so they should be on shelves now. So real Canadian liquor stores, I know, ordered a bunch. Uh, a bunch of other stores did as well. Just kind of follow the, uh, the uh, check out Liquor Connect uh, to see where it is. Or also follow uh, uh, Oilers, uh, uh, official Nation Beer account uh, for kind of updates as new stores kind of come up. But uh, new cans are there. So we've got a double batch uh, of uh, Canada cans. And the guys uh, are rushing another order. So we might have more available right near the end of the month to get out just before Canada if you need to load up again. So, uh, yeah, Nation Beer is, uh, is rocking and rolling. It's, uh, it's been a very fun project to work on. And can we get a status update on the, uh, did Mamas lose out in the donor bracket? <sighs> oh, okay. Sorry. Sadly she did. So here's the thing. I fucked up. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> give myself, I didn't book any time off. I didn't, I should have done my homework. I should have known her matchup was yesterday. So I was busy all day and couldn't start really working on trying to canvas boats until after Nation Happy Hour. We're already like 70% of the way into the boat and Famous is crushing mama. But how can you how can you get involved and, and, and lobby for votes? Isn't that unfair? Well, no, because the whole point of the so I'm trying to lead by example. The whole point of this is to get people together around their shop and try to push them through and win their matchups. So canvas wow. for votes for your shop do all that right that's kind of part of the fun and engagement piece so i want to do you know i'm telling people to do this so i better fucking do it too uh when when our shop's up chalmers mama i count as your shop too um <laughs> and uh so i want to leave my example so i did a very good job for her to win the regionals i was shooting videos with her we we're getting some good messaging a lot of people were going to see her and we were sharing all the positive feedback and it worked really well now famous is a uh a very worthy adversary, I will say that. Um, so last night in desperation, I'm like, well, what can I do? Like that's you know that, that I that I feel is fair within my power. So I reach out to Larvenin. I'm like, Larvenin, I need the fins on board. Get him to vote. I reached out to Ufe. Ufe, get the Swedes on board. Just, just give him a reason. Just whatever. Just tell him to vote. And Ufe did. And Larvenin went on his Twitch feed and. That's why Mama was getting killed. And I was able to get her back to about 50-ish percent, 48% of the vote on Twitter. 
And then I was able to elevate her Facebook and Instagram, but it wasn't enough. It was too late. Uh, it was, yeah, it was too late in the game to, to do it, but I, I tried. And I, I went I went international. How many votes? Uh, there was, there was, there was, I can pull it up the exact total, but there was thousands. I mean, I it for Mama. Yeah. Where well, is famous? Short Park. Ah. Uh, so I had yeah, so in a good... total, there was about 2,000 votes on that one yesterday. If you really wanted her to win, you should have said, if you vote for her and come down right now, I'll buy you a donor. See, but that, then, then that's kind of outside of the spirit of this. It has to be like a function of like, effort and propaganda and all that stuff not buying votes uh, i just i thought about it trust chalmers uh <laughs> but uh but decided against it because for the same reason of like well why are you doing that should you be doing that like it looks like you're ringing it i'm like no i'm just trying just as hard as anyone else can to try to get the shop to win and i'm not going to keep my buying votes i did put out a tweet uh yesterday asking about uh how, how does one write a bot to uh to rig a don't air vote uh and it was funny kind of the replies i got to that because people thought i was serious uh and like shaming me and then one guy actually pointed me in a direction to where i actually could do it yeah you <laughs> thought it was very out, helpful you, you program it like a, you can track a grid on a screen and then you basically just write a program to have a pixel press at a certain like you're playing battleship basically and if yeah. it's a click vote you just write a script that says like click e5 click 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 yeah, yeah. So I, I, I tried. So I uh, had a good meeting with Sherman Ford yesterday, and uh, we're coming up with a uh, interesting plan for the winner uh, slash minor. We'll say we'll call it a minor event for whoever wins uh, as part of their uh, uh, their prize for winning. So stay tuned for that. I can't actually. You know what? Just because we're talking about the donor bracket, today's the finals: Mena's versus Famous, and. I'm telling you, Beaumont is coming out in droves. Even the, I'm just looking at it right now on Twitter. The city of Beaumont's Twitter account is also <laughs> urging people to go. For real? Yeah. yeah. It got political? It, it got political, but that's the best, as it should. Well, what's more political than a fucking don't air vote off? I ask you that. Yes, exactly. Very political. My favorite part of our interview with Jordan yes, or last episode was how he said that he had been following the don't air <laughs> bracket challenge. That guy was the oh, best. Hardened off too. Yeah, he was yeah. the best, and I and I respect him for not eating them. I, you know what I love about it though is honestly, the spirit of it is getting people into local businesses, trying donairs, different shops they don't know about, and seeing all the people that have tried different shops based on the brackets, based on stuff they didn't hear about. That's what it's all about. It's all fun, mm-hmm. and the passion people have for their specific shops makes me laugh one hundred percent of the time. Like even today, I'm going through the comments, and it's like people are arguing about Mena's versus Famous Donaire, which are our two finalists, and then people are throwing in their two cents, like high voltage got screwed, and it's just like it's the best. I, I went, it. I went for dinner last night at a Vietnamese restaurant with my family, and next door, really close to my house, was a restaurant with a Donaire shop called Tasty with two eyes. Was that in your guest bracket? Uh, no, we, did it have didn't. A, we did have a tasty it, donair, but I don't know which one. I, I saw it after. Like, so basically, Tomers, what we do is we, we do like an intake uh, period where we say, we want to start a donair bracket. Everyone send in your shops. And obviously, brackets can only be like, you know, 16, 32, or 64. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we didn't have enough shops for 64. So what we did is we took all the the 32 most voted on shops and made a bracket off of that. And ah. then for all the haters and people that were uh, complaining that their shop didn't get in, we opened up a second opportunity for a wild card. Ooh, the play in the not uh, the not the play- in tournament. Right. So then, so then, but and so what? What happened was we did that. We had a winner, and then the winner had to go through uh, the the regional champion gauntlet and, and go head to head against all of the the winners from their region to try to take them out. And sure as shit, the wild card winner won faced Burger Baron in his first match, but took down the Baron and got into the final four. So who was that? Walk Don't Air. Wow. Walk the Don't Air, Cinderella's Sweat, story. Bag Milk, Walk Don't Air, Sweat, YG Food Guide about their status <laughs> in the Don't Air thing. Like, we are fucking able, but anyways, 
crazy. They're hot. I love it. The DMs are funny too. It's like, hey, can you vote for us in the donor thing? And we always just respond with, you know, good luck, best of luck. Here you yeah. go. But they come back every single time. I loved it. Walk in there is hilarious. Part of it annoys me. I'm like, fuck off, Oilers Nation. We're doing our own thing over here. And then part of me is like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> All right, guys, any other uh, closing thoughts before I, uh, before I give Jappa some love when we get out of here? Are we going to throw a little can... noodle of bone here? With the <laughs> oh, yeah, the charity. Yeah, what's uh, what's the charity of the week here? I know I asked you on uh, – no, I didn't ask you on Monday. Uh, this week we are partnered with Kids with Cancer. Ah. So uh, pretty self-explanatory uh, what they do. They create a lot of programs to support uh, kids that are going through that tough fight, uh, and they're they're getting scrappy right now. Uh, in the sense of they refuse to cut back any of their programs. So they're getting scrappy to fundraise. They're doing bottle drives. They're doing all kind of crazy stuff they normally you know, wouldn't need to do in a normal environment to keep the funds coming in to keep these programs alive. So uh, they were very appreciative of uh, partnering up with us. Uh, highly recommend checking out the video we launched so you could hear Val kind of uh, spread the message of what they do. Very powerful, but... Uh, yeah, so that's who we're working with this week. Super cool. And then uh, sending food at the end of the week to uh, the people at iHuman. And additionally, while Jay uses the Oodle Noodle platform to help society, Bag Milk and I write funny, funny memes for it on Instagram, Oodle Noodle Gram. Did you remember Bag Milk, the physical distancing meme I wrote? I do, yep. That one was that, hilarious. That is the most liked photo in the history of the Oodle Noodle Instagram account. So <laughs> props to Which me. one? It just shows, like, how far you need to stay away from different types of people, like toxic people, vegans, and then people who eat your spring rolls. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can't no. fucking describe a meme, Chalmers. Like, what's the yes, you can. Lisa? It's got what's a little person. What's the Mona Lisa look like, Chalmers? You fucking tell me. An, a, a, a four out of ten. That's what she looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Chalmers, I declare you first star of today's podcast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. From the crime story. The one in 12 shows, because you are very funny. (laughs) Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Make sure you check out Japa Machinery as well. We tag them in all our Instagram posts. You can head to our Instagram, at Real Life Podcast, and then you can go to Japa's Instagram. Follow us both. Two birds, one stone. There you go. Shout out to Japa. Check them out online. JapaMachinery.com. Also, I think it's confirmed. No, I think we're already one week from today. We'll be chatting with... Uh, Alberta product, country music star, Brett Kissel. Going to be talking about his concert series, his love for the oil, getting to be a color commentator, all that good stuff. So look for that a week from today. Guys, thanks for giving me an hour again. Peace out. Later. Episode 189 of the Real Life Podcast is over. Great job on making it through the entire hour of the Real Life Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. 